the next talk is on Python powered machine learning in the cloud by Stephen Hoover, who is a data scientist at CVS Analytics, Chicago based technology company dedicated to helping organizations use data they have to connect with the people they care about most. His background is in physics and cosmology, and after having spent a while coding data analysis in C, he has discovered Python and has now been using it for numeric analysis in both academia and industry for about five years and enjoying every minute of it. Right. So, yeah, as you said, uh, I have a background. My, I have a PhD in physics, and in my graduate work, I was coding in C. So, doing data analysis using terabytes of data, it was a lot of fun. It took a lot of work. So, I came to the University of Chicago, did a postdoc in cosmology. There, I started using Python. So, Python, uh, much better for numerical analysis. It's much faster for coding, and uh, with the tools available, it's uh, it's very powerful. So after I left the University of Chicago, I came to Civis. And Civis, uh, Civis is a company located here in Chicago. It's about two years old now. I've been working there for about a year. And Civis, uh, Civis is also a cloud-based data science platform. So uh, Civis, it's a bit like a power tool for data science. So it helps data scientists work better, smarter, faster. Uh, makes your life a little bit easier. And I will give you a, a brief overview of the platform, and then I'll dive into exactly where Python fits in and some of the things that we've learned while making it. So the first thing you need to do if you have data is get the data all in one place so you can use it. And so the Civis platform, uh, it lets you bring in data from many different sources. It has connections for all sorts of databases. You can even drag and drop CSVs in, which is what I uh, end up doing a lot. So if you have all of these different tables, you'll often want to link records together from tables. So if you have person information, say name, address, phone number, that maybe aren't quite exactly the same in different tables, Civis has smart algorithms that let you join those together and combine those tables. Uh, it has an in-browser SQL. So uh, a lot of our clients are very good at SQL, so this, this tool lets them explore the data, add columns, do some feature creation, exp uh, early exploration. So this is the part that I'm going to get into more in just a couple minutes, but optimize. So once you have these data in your platform, uh, once you've created some new features, have some idea what's going on, you can then build predictive models using that data. So after you've built your predictive models, then you have to actually make them useful. And so that involves talking to other people. So Civis will create reports for you. It works with Tableau or D3. Uh, you can take the outputs, uh, take the information from these tables uh, or from the outputs of your predictive models, make reports, share them with decision makers or fellow data scientists. And of course, you can automate all this. So if you're getting data coming in continuously, you can keep, your tables will keep refreshing, your models will keep rebuilding, your reports will be continuously updated. Uh, this can happen in the middle of the night. You can wake up refreshed, have breakfast, go to work, and your boss has already seen the report. So uh, into the interesting stuff. So predictive modeling. We use several different languages in Civis. Uh, the web stuff is mostly in Ruby on Rails. We use Golang for some of the fast stuff. JavaScript for visualizations. Uh, I mentioned the databases are, are SQL. But we use Python for all the machine learning. So you, you press go on this, uh, on this machine learning task, and that is all going out into Python. So I probably don't need to work too hard on this, but Python, uh, I believe, is really the right way to do it. So Python is really great for developing. It's quick to write. There's uh, lots of resources, so that's a part of your developer time too, right? Uh, it's, it's hard for me to know how, how would I code if Stack Overflow didn't exist. It would probably take 10 times longer. Uh, so you can code badly in any language, but Python code, when it's done well, is relatively easy to read, test, and maintain. And one of the most important things is that you get to leverage other people's work. Lots of online uh, open source libraries available for you to use. So uh, this is the first choice that I want to talk about. We code in Python 3. So I know uh, there seems to be some debate in the community, Python 2 versus Python 3. 
if you're starting a new project, I think you really should go with Python 3. So Python 2, for, for some time now, it's just been getting security updates. It's on 2.7. There will never be a 2.8. Uh, some people have been backporting new features from Python 3 to Python 2, but it doesn't have all of them. All the new development is going to Python 3, and Python 2 support ceases completely in 2020. So if you want your code to last, code in Python 3. Uh, lots of fun new language features in Python 3. Uh, if you do have to code in Python 2 for some reason, it's pretty easy to make your code forward, forward compatible. So uh, if you're stuck with Python 2, from future import division print function. And then make sure that you don't use any Python 2 only syntax. So it's not, not too hard. Uh, something that I just want to highlight is this, uh, this is something we ran into recently at Civis. So uh, some multiprocessing libraries have, sorry, some, um, some linear algebra libraries interact poorly with the Python multiprocessing. So we, um, we were running into issues where uh, there's code that works fine in development, but, uh, sorry, in production, but uh, I often develop on OS X. OSX's accelerate library is multi-threaded in such a way that if you, if you call a linear algebra routine on both sides of a fork, it will just crash. That, that's kind of inconvenient. Uh, Python 3 adds a new backend they call fork server that's, uh, that works a lot better with this. So 3.4 only. So another reason to go with Python 3. There are a couple of gotchas. If you're coming from Python 2, uh, a lot of the things that you get from the standard libraries are now iterables. So that's one thing to get used to. Uh, the one real bug-inducing gotcha that I'd point out is that the, the slash sign in Python 2, if you had 2 divided by 4, you would get 0 because you know, integer division, right? In Python 3, every, all division is float division. And so this, this has once or twice caused some really subtle bugs that were, uh, that were a little annoying when I finally found them. Uh, so almost all of the libraries, uh, all of the big libraries are Python 3 compatible. Uh, there's some libraries you run into occasionally that, that are not Python 3 compatible, but uh, that's an opportunity for you to contribute to open source code. So still a good thing. Uh, so when you are designing a project, uh, the first thing, of course, is to know what, what uh, your inputs are. What is this doing? So Civis is working largely with tabular data. Uh, so this is what it looks like. You have rows. You have columns. So keep this in mind in the next few slides. We use a lot of different libraries at Civis. I'm just going to highlight three of my personal favorites, three that get used a lot. And... Uh, Skipper talked a lot about a couple of these in, uh, this morning. But I, I really have to start here with the unit test library. So last speaker emphasized this. It's been mentioned a couple times already in the conference. But if you haven't tested it, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I was recently upgrading some of our capabilities. I sat down. I, I worked on it. I wrote out the code. It was working in all the test cases that I had on, on the command line. And then I said, OK, it's done. I'll just, uh, I'll just finish up with the testing and then push it into production. Uh, the very first test I wrote did not pass. So yeah, testing, testing is very important. Special shout out to Nose here. So uh, especially the, the coverage option. If you are testing code, you can write your unit tests. If you add on this uh, dash dash with coverage when you're running the test, you'll get a little report that tells you which lines of your module you did not hit. So take a look at that. Go back into your code. Take a look at those lines. Uh, if they look at all important, write new unit tests that will hit those lines. So I, I have personally found that very useful. So back into the libraries. NumPy, I sometimes forget that NumPy is not part of the standard library. It's just so essential for numeric work. Uh, it's it organizes data into arrays. So in Python, you have lists. Lists are, if you do any work with C, lists are just, uh, they're pointers. You have a bunch of pointers to arbitrary objects. And so when the Python interpreter is iterating through lists, it can get kind of slow. NumPy creates 
arrays not of pointers but of actual numbers. So these are like C arrays. And when you're doing any operations with NumPy arrays, all of that, uh, all of that is running in C, so it's pretty fast. Uh, pandas. So pandas is wonderful for working with tables. If you have any kind of tabular data, you probably want to be using pandas. Uh, it lets you do queries, lets you manipulate your tables. You can index by rows, index by columns. Uh, one really powerful capability is reading and writing from disk. So you don't have to write your own CSV reader. Uh, HDF5 is also very well supported. So uh, I have, uh, for a side project I'm using, I have a, a several gigabyte large HDF5 file. You can iterate through those one piece at a time. Pandas makes it really easy to create that, append to it, and read through it. Uh, and again, pandas is uh, all down in C and Cython where, where it can be, so pandas is relatively fast. And scikit-learn. If you're doing machine learning, uh, there are, there's code in, in more than one place, so stats models also has a lot of good code, but scikit-learn is really core machine learning tools. It provides you a toolkit with things like gradient boosting trees, uh, cross-validation grid searches, all these you've seen during the course of the conference. Uh, all sorts of tools for evaluating your models as well. And again, scikit-learn where possible. It's calling down to C, so relatively fast. Uh, and this is just a, a short toy example of all of those three packages working together. So import your pandas, uh, numpy, scikit-learn. Use pandas to read in the data. You can then use scikit-learn to do a quick fit on those, on those data. In this case, I'm using the iris data set. There's three different classes. And so if you predict the probability of membership in each of those classes, you get an array out. I, I could have called also predict, and it would just tell me predict class membership. But what if I've already, I want separately the probabilities, so I have this array sitting around. You can use NumPy to uh, quickly grab the, the predicted class for each of those, find which of those probabilities is the greatest. Right, so a couple of the other lessons that we've learned in the course of making these libraries. So reusable code. What is reusable code? So uh, reusable code is a library. It's something that you're going to be calling again and again from different contexts. So NumPy, uh, all these things that I've talked about are great examples of that because uh, NumPy, SciPy, uh, Scikit-Learn, these are code that are used by many different people in many different contexts. Uh, that's what reusable code is. So things to think about when you're making code that you want to be reusable, which not all code has to be. Have some sort of standard public interface. Think about how people are going to use this. Make sure that you document everything. So anything that somebody other than the internal code is using needs to be well documented. If I'm in the interpreter, I want to be able to type help function name and see what the inputs of this should be, what the expected outputs are. And it's really easy to write doc strings, so just, just do it. And of course, write tests for everything. If it is not tested, it does not work. It does not exist. Uh, extensible code. So extensible code is a little bit different than reusable code. So extensible code is something that you're going to add to in the future. So you, you write your library, it does something, then sometime in the future you want to go back, you want to add in more pieces. So in the past it built me a model, fine, but now I want to build a model on different kinds of data or I want to make the model a little bit different. So when you're writing extensible code, uh, I think that's actually a lot harder than writing reusable code. And you should sit down, you should think about how to make things more general, try to think about abstractions for what you're doing, uh, try to break down the, the essential parts of this. Uh, so uh, multiple inheritance is one thing that I found useful. So if you haven't heard of the, the term before, there are what's called mixins. So a mixin is a class which is not intended to be instantiated by itself, but uh, it defines functions, uh, it, it would define several sets of functions, and then you can have other classes 
inherit from these mix-ins and then they automatically have those functions. So it's one way to write code that can be used in different parts of a library. But really the, the primary lesson for writing extensible code that I have is, is really that you're gonna screw it up the first time. The thing that you wrote that you thought would generalize and be easy to extend, it isn't. So you have to be willing to go back, refactor your code, rewrite. So try to get it right the first time, but expect that you probably will, will not get it right the first time. Uh, right, so I guess in summary, uh, Python is great for large scale projects. Uh, make sure to check out what, what libraries are already available. So don't rewrite something that's already written. There's, there's no need to rewrite your own dot product generator, for example, that's in NumPy. And think about where you're going, but always go back, be willing to go back and refactor. Make sure to allow time for that if, uh, because it's probably going to be necessary. So, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Any questions? You mentioned that you're using Python 3. Yes. Uh, of being able to talk. You mentioned one feature that, uh, or at least you mentioned async I.O. Um, are you actually using async I.O.? Uh, if so, how and what's your experience with it then? And have you used Twisted before for other stuff? Uh, I don't believe we're using async I.O. at all right now. That's, that's something that I'd like to learn more about. So I think it could be helpful, but uh, not using it right now, sorry. Yes. Are you calling any Golang functions from inside Python? Have you built any bridges or interfaces between those two languages? No, not yet. We, we are calling R. So we do use RPy2 at, at Civis. So there's, uh, as has been discussed, there's some good statistical stuff in R. But uh, Go exists in the larger platform code base, but we're not calling it directly from Python. Python uh, over R? I think Python's easier to develop a large project in. It's easier to develop in, to, to maintain a code base. So uh, for, uh, yeah, easier to develop and deploy. So you have all these, these tests and utilities, unit tests, for example. It's easier to collaborate on large projects. R is, is good for statistical modeling, and it's good for visualizations. Less good, I think, for development. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.